all our international comrades um, joining this uh, webinar of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign South Africa. It's a very crucial um, webinar. Um, it is addressing the question of where to with boycott, divestment and sanctions and Palestine liberation. Um, before we go in and introduce our guest speakers um, to some kind of administration, um, for all kinds of engagements and questions, please pose your question on the chat section and we'll get the um, speakers to address those um, after everyone um, has um, spoken. By way of introduction, let me first say um, that of course, boycott and sanctions has its history in the liberation struggle in South Africa. It emerged in the 1960s after the Sharpeville massacre and found its way into the first uh, UN agreement, a non-binding agreement on sanctions in 1964. And this campaign in turn led to a very crucial moment, which was the adoption by the UN of the International Convention on the suppression and punishment of the crime of apartheid in 1973. And this was led by African governments and, and Russia, and then consequently adopted by 109 uh, countries. The anti-apartheid movement was so um, important and had been able to mobilize in major countries that even in the US in 1986, the US government had to pass the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act of 1986. So the topic for today, I think, has a broader history and of course also is based on precedence um, of the um, South African um, struggle. And uh, by way of introduction, I would like to just uh, introduce our uh, speakers for today. Uh, uh, we have Chief Zweli Lile Mandela, also known more popularly as Comrade Mandla Mandela. Uh, he is a member of parliament of the leading party, the African National um, Congress, and is also, of course, um, the grandson of our struggle icon, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Uh, we also have um, Comrade Ziad Patel, who is an attorney, he's an international human rights um, lawfare activist. Um, Ziad has also had much experience in terms of defending individuals and NGOs in local and international human rights matters. We also have a long-standing comrade in the Palestinian struggle, Comrade Jamia Khalant um, of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign in South Africa. She's currently working in education development at the University um, of Cape Town and is active in the broader political landscape um, in South Africa. Um, we are going to order the kind of presentation as follows. Comrade Ziad is going to just give a short presentation on why do we need the IPSRA the bill, which is basically the implementation and protection of Palestinian solidarity rights bill, IPSRA. Um, why do we need that for about five minutes? And then Comrade Zweli Velile is going to uh, make some remarks um, on the challenges that will confront um, such a, a, a process. And then we will go back to Comrade Ziad um, in the program and followed by Comrade uh, Jamia. Comrade Ziad, welcome. Uh, can you please uh, unmute yourself? Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Comrade Eddie. Um, thank you for the introduction and a good evening to all the guests and to the organizers of this important webinar. I think this is a critical webinar in dealing with the Palestinian solidarity movement and how we take the solidarity movement to the next level. Uh, I'm pleased to see Comrade Mandla on the panel, as well as other comrades uh, to participate. And I want to also thank the Palestine Solidarity Committee for arranging this webinar during the Israeli Apartheid Week. Um, to bring into context why we need 
an institutionalized campaign will take some time, but I'm understanding that to briefly explain why we need IPSRA. We know that the Palestinian cause is at a, a, at a, at a, at a tipping point where many international speakers and international academics and human rights defenders have been saying that Palestinians are undergoing an incremental genocide. If not an incremental genocide, in fact, a genocide. Um, we have been assisting Palestinians in different types of atrocities that have com been committed and perpetrated by the Israeli occupying forces. In 2008, 2009, there was Operation Castled. Then there was in 2012, Pillow of Defense. And then in 2014, Operation Protective Edge. Um, and if one gets to understand the context of the kind of conflict and military aggression by the Israeli occupying forces against a predominantly unarmed civilian uh, population in a densely populated area like the Gaza Strip, apart from the systematic apartheid colonial policies that many have spoken about and Israel been guilty about, as well as the increased expansion of settlements in the West Bank. Um, South Africa sits with a huge responsibility. Uh, and if we're going to be following in our founding father's footsteps that we will not be free until Palestine is free, then we need to be taking the Palestinian cause to the next level. Um, with this in mind and the kind of work that I've been involved in as a lawfare advocate, uh, the IPSRA bill initiative was then drafted uh, through the many different kinds of engagements that I had dealing with, for instance, Khadija Davids from Cape Town when she was aboard the Mavi Mamra, uh, the Gaza docket, as well as in protective, uh, Operation Protective Edge um, and representing Palestinian prisoners' rights and child prisoners at the United Nations Human Rights Council um, and many, many academics and many activists from around the globe speaking about how do we strengthen the international intifada and make an impactful uh, contribution towards the Palestinian cause. With that in mind uh, was the initiative of the IPSRA bill. I will deal with the IPSRA bill later on, but I want also, you know, uh, the uh, observers and uh, listeners today uh, viewers to understand that IPSRA is an initiative that is all encompassing, which deals with lawfare advocacy, as well as an institutionalized boycotts, divestments and sanctions campaign. Uh, and taking that to the level of government, whereby we have parliament pass legislation. Uh, I will go more into detail with the kind of legislation and what is novel and what is, hasn't been done before, because this would be a precedent kind of initiative, and what has been done previously. And I think uh, Eddie has spoken previously about initiatives by other countries during the height of the apartheid struggle. Uh, once Comrade Mandla has given his input, uh, and I'll leave it for the, uh, uh, at that for now, Eddie. Thank you. Comrade Mandla? Thank you, Comrade Eddy, our program director, our fellow panelists, uh, Sister Jamia Garland, as well as Brother Ziad Patel, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. I greet you in the universal greetings of peace, justice, and human rights for all. May our deliberations today be blessed, fruitful, and drive us closer to the goal of a free Palestine. Allow me at the outset to thank the, organiza the organizers for arranging this discussion on a topic of critical importance with the pro-BDS bill. Allow me to preface my remarks with an, an acknowledgement. I was very excited and pleased to read that the South African Palestine solidarity organizations have developed a draft bill. The protection and promotion of Palestinian solidarity rights in South Africa, IPSRA, for the purpose of legislating BDS. The first of its kind with the principal objective of achieving legislation for the implementation of BDS. 
I want to add that comrades, that we must always be vigilant and alert to the machinization of the detractors and enemies of Palestinian struggle. We must especially avoid the eschewed dissent and frivolous disagreements within our own ranks. Those are all the willy tricks in the poisonous arsenal of our enemies. Every platform for Palestine and in support of Palestine, of the Palestinian struggle, is a platform that we must support. We must eschew organizational rivalry and rather focus our attention on the work at hand. This is essential if we are to succeed and this and other initiatives in support of the Palestinian struggle. So a special word of thanks to all who have done the preparatory spade work in initiating this process. It is a long overdue and is a worthy contribution to our collective efforts to mobilize all sectors of society towards our mutual goals of ending the occupation, right of return of all Palestinian refugees, freeing of all political prisoners, stopping expansion of illegal settlements and securing the right to free political determination for all citizens of occupied Palestine. As we begin our deliberations today, we are reminded of the words of the late comrade Dalla Omar during his tenure as our country's first minister of justice, when he said, I quote, we must be careful of passing legislation for things we already have the power to do, close quote. This is not a critique of the pro BDS bill, nor a judgment of where we have come in our struggle for a free Palestine. On the contrary, it is merely a moment of reflection and introspection. We have neither as a ruling party nor as government or organs of state demonstrated the level of commitment as may be expected of us. In this respect, we are conflicted between the policy, political will, and the intransigence of our political players, officials, and bureaucracy. The embarrassment of having a chief justice that turns a blind eye to the long history of human rights violation, crimes against humanity, and ethnic cleansing and genocide by apartheid Israel is symptomatic of what we have to contend with. Whilst we are the first to advocate free speech and the right to hold a dissenting view, we must acknowledge that it is a systematic failure that allows this level of ignorance, arrogance, and myopia to find place in the most senior ranks of the judiciary. While South Africa cannot claim leadership of the Palestinian struggle, despite being viewed as one of the foremost proponents of the struggle against Zionist occupation of Palestine, we must understand where and in what context our pro-BDS bill is located. There is much groundwork to be, to be done in order to secure the groundswell support for an initiative of this nature. We will have to ensure that we secure participation of all civil society structures, unions, business formations, the ecumenical and faith-based movements and various progressive political structures. I speak without fear of contradiction that our pro BDS mobilization has not yet reached its full potential. This is partially because of the constraints attributed to the pandemic conditions, as well as our search for fresh and innovative approaches to an old problem. It is true 
that lawfare has long been a weapon in the arsenal of liberation struggle all over the world. Even the apartheid Israeli lobby in London attempted three years ago to scupper the Palestine Expo in London, United Kingdom through the efforts of lawyers for Israel. This in itself demonstrates and recognizes the power of lawfare as a legitimate tool of struggle in our own quest for freedom in South Africa and the heyday of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, as well as the 1990s anti-apartheid movement in the UK lawfare was a highly effective tool of struggle. Though the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign at the time started out a feeble protest led by some shop attendants, it was sincerity of the voices and the determination of their actions that triggered the avalanche. It is in such a context within which our pro BDS bill must land rather than whimper of irrelevant and sporadic protest. We require mobilization on an unprecedented scale in support of the pro BDS bill. We have made numerous calls in support of boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign, but our gains have been modest and much more is needed to secure the required level of support. Therefore, comrades and friends, I reiterate the need for sectoral mobilization and engagement and to ensure that we achieve the correct level of support. I am on record comrades and friends, as saying that BDS movement has breathed new life and impetus into the struggle for Palestine and has taken root on, a continent, on all continents, on universities and other academic institutions, amongst international parliaments and a plethora of other sites and structures. It is in the other facets of struggle. However, that we require greater hegemony and tangible support. In the South African context, our most effective stage in my view was when internal mobilization of the mass democratic movement aligned with the peak of armed struggle, the height of the global diplomacy and thus created an atmosphere in which the call for boycott, divestment and sanctions found the greatest resonance. Equally important to our efforts to engage progressive lawfare is to ensure that our efforts to engage and intensify the BDS campaigns is extended. We must as a matter of priority address the contradictions and failures in our own systems, including the denial of visa status of, uh, the denial of visa-free status of Palestinians, whilst apartheid Israel enjoys such privilege, especially security status of El Al at OR Tambo International Airport, and assess the movements of financial support goods and services to apartheid Israel. We cannot accept Madiba's advice that Palestine is the greatest moral issue of our time, yet allow such contradictions to persist and perpetuate. We must get our house in order. This is absolutely critical as the Zionist apartheid Israeli lobby will come at our pro BDS bill with all guns blazing. We must expect obstructionism at every corner and at every turn. We must prepare for legal challenges and virulent attacks on our key campaign heads. I am in full support of the draft bill, the protection and promotion of Palestinian solidarity rights in South Africa. 
with the purpose of legislating BDS. This is a historic moment, comrades, in our struggle for a free Palestine. We must ensure that the wide spectrum of public engagement is mobilized and that we create global awareness of the campaign. For too long now, has apartheid Israel continued its atrocities, ignored international law, and made a mockery of the International Criminal Court. All of this is in broad daylight and within full view of the international community. This draft bill, comrades, supports my long-held view that BDS is the most powerful tool in the hands of the Palestinian people and of activists in the international solidarity movement who equally support justice and human rights for the Palestinian people. I have no doubt that this action today will reverberate in the corridors of power around the world. And I agree with the sentiments of the late German French Holocaust survivor, diplomat and author, Stefan Hessel, who said, I quote, BDS campaigns around the world present the most promising way to overcome the failure of the world governments to stand up to Israelis' intransigence and lawless behavior, close quote. I thank you, comrades, and wish you well in tonight's deliberations and looking forward to this bill coming before parliament. I thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Manla Mandela. I think that it's a really um, comprehensive um, input you have given us. I think there's some great key um, guidance for the movement um, as a whole. I think it's a very inspiring um, presentation you have made. And I think that had this been a public meeting, there would have been a standing ovation. But uh, we're working with the limits of um, technology. <laughs> so thank you very, very much for the time that you've, you've made available. I understand that you have other um, pressing um, issues to see to um, right now. Um, so, so thank you very, very much for, for, for making the time. And that we hope we will keep in touch and then uh, um, have some kind of further discussion on how we take um, the IPSRA ball forward. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you please unmute? Can you please unmute? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you now. Yeah. Uh, we're coming back to Comrade Zia just to continue his discussion um, as part of the program. Maybe go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Um, comrades, I must say that listening to Comrade Mandla, uh, to an extent, um, we feel that this bill, this IPSRA bill, was an instrument that was long overdue. Um, I think, you know, why do we need the IPSRA bill? Um, we need to understand the genocide context. Uh, Comrade Mandla has also spoken about the importance of taking the solidarity movement to the next level and that current kinds of BDS that we have had in place has not had the kind of impacts that is required uh, in terms of making those changes and those differences that are required. So I'm going to split my presentation into uh, the current situation and the context that prevails in Palestine. And after that, uh, we will then look at the IPSRA bill, uh, where I have a PowerPoint presentation and we can look at some of the provisions and then take a discussion from there. Um, so as I go ahead, I want to be speaking about certain quotes. Um, Ronnie Casserell said this in 2001. Israel's, the, Israel's conquest and occupation with the latest land grab caused by its monstrous, monstrous apartheid war and continued construction of the illegal settlements has reduced the West Bank into several disconnected pockets amounting to 12% of former Palestine. 
And furthermore, he says, the people's parliament should be unanimous in calling for Israel's immediate withdrawal from the occupied territories, lifting the physical, economic, and financial blockade and siege of Gaza and the West Bank, removing the physical impediments to the freedom of movement of Palestinians, including the wall, and over 500 checkpoints dismantling the illegal settlements, releasing 10,000 political prisoners, of which were 113 women and children amongst them, negotiating a just solution with the elected representatives of the Palestinian people, and implementing the UN resolutions, including Resolution 194 of 1948 concerning the right of return of the refugees. And this is what Comrade Ronnie said on the parliamentary debate on Palestine-Israeli issue, but on, on 23rd of October 2001. So already the call has been made long ago by some of the Palestinian stalwarts uh, to parliament to try and intervene. Also wanting to speak about um, what, what it entails, what entails uh, genocide. Uh, genocide is uh, constituted as a serious and egregious crime and is contained in the Rome Statute. And genocide has been unleashed in different forms by the Israeli occupying forces. Just to speak a little bit about this, just give me a moment to find this presentation. Um, yes, so when the when Operation Castled happened in 2008, 2009, and after that, uh, once the fact-finding mission report was uh, founded by the United Nations, there was it was in, it was called the Goldstone Report. You know there were certain retractions at that time, but one of the one of the findings in that Goldstone Report stated at paragraph 1887. The timing of the first Israeli attack at 11.30 a.m. on a weekday when children were returning from school and the streets of Gaza were crowded with people going about their daily business appears to have been calculated to create the, the greatest disruption and widespread panic among the civilian population. The treatment of many civilians detained or even killed while trying to surrender is one manifestation of the way in which the effective rules of engagement, standard operating procedures, and instructions to the troops on the ground appear to have been framed in order to create an environment in which due regard for civilian lives and basic human dignity was replaced with disregard for basic international humanitarian law and human rights norms. And of significance is that the Israeli attack happened at 11.30 a.m. on a weekday when children were returning from school. Um, I want to also speak about Norman Finkelstein where he does a critique of the 2014 fact-finding mission report. And I think this is critical to our, our understanding as to why there's the need within the context of genocide that South Africa has to now take the next step. Uh, our solidarity movements need to be able to uh, thrust the, the process forward and insist on a parliamentary bill that, that gets passed in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, in, this, in this critique of the 2014 fact-finding mission, um, there was different considerations with by how the Israeli occupying forces had imposed uh, the siege on the Gaza Strip, what kinds of military warfare was used on predominantly a civilian population. And just to speak about airstrikes, because we need to put us to understand that the conflict in, in the Gaza Strip or the wars that were unleashed was never of equal proportion. And that's where lawfare comes in. Lawfare deals with uh, utilizing proper legal mechanisms as a weapon of law of war in a productive way, which is a peaceful tool at the disposal of, of those that are oppressed against the oppressor. Um, because you cannot oppose the kind of military prowess that Israel is being supported by European nations and the US. So that's where the lawfare context comes in, is to hold war criminals accountable for crimes perpetrated with impunity. And lawfare can be utilized in instances of crimes of aggression, crimes against humanity, war crimes. Uh, and part of the crimes of against humanity could be torture and also colonial practices and apartheid. Now, this is what Norman Finkelstein takes out of that report for 2014 on airstrikes. He says, 
the UN report observed that as a result of Israeli airstrikes targeting residential and other buildings, at least 142 Palestinian families had three or more members killed in the same incident for a total of 742 fatalities. Two survivors of such attacks recalled respectively these scenes. And listen to this. I found the decapitated bodies of my uncle and daughter. My cousin was alive but died on the way to the hospital. Another cousin's body was found sliced in two. We had 10 corpses in the first ambulance. No other survivors were found. After having removed the cement, I identified my cousin Dina's body. What I witnessed was horrible. She was nine months pregnant and she had come from a home to her parents' house to have a baby. We could not imagine that she had passed away. Her stomach was ripped open and the unborn baby was lying there with the skull shattered. We kept searching for other corpses and found my uncle's wife. We had great difficulty removing all the pieces of cement from her body. I had a close look at the bodies. Only the upper part of my nine-year-old's daughter's body was left. My son Muhammad had his intestines coming out. My 16-year-old cousin had lost his two legs. My son Mustafa was five meters away from me, had received shrapnel that almost completely severed his neck. My 16-year-old nephew lost both his legs and arms. He asked for my help. I just really wanted to die, uh, him to die quickly. I didn't want him to go through so much suffering. There was also my one-year-old daughter who was in her mother's arms. We found her body on the tree. I myself lost my left arm. And this is in a critique of the report just on airstrikes. We know that also the Israeli occupying forces had, um, had, had attacked ambulances and medical personnel that were on their way to go and attend to the injured and the wounded, where these kind of military munitions are utilized in a very densely populated Gaza Strip. Um, and I will deal with why we speak about genocide and where Norman Finkelstein makes the difference between, uh, you know, between the intent of the Israeli, of, of the Israeli defense force. Um, whereas international law would speak about proportion and distinction in advancement of a military objective, Norman Finkelstein's critique of it is that Israel is wholly accountable for for, 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 for the crimes that were perpetrated because it was not only against any sort of armed conflict or combatants, but because of wanting to having issues with Hamas or because wanting the Palestinian people to turn against Hamas and then collectively punish the entire Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip. Uh, just to go further up into some of the stats uh, and viewers can then make up their own minds about this but the, the statistics speaks for itself. Um, and this is protective edge. We know that I think almost one third of the 2000 people that were killed in that war, uh, one third of them were, uh, were women and children. Um, and just have a look at this. Civilians killed 1,600, Israel six, the ratio 270 is to one. Children killed 550, Israel one, the ratio 550 is to one. Homes severely damaged or destroyed, 18,000 in the Gaza Strip, Israel won, 18,000 to one. Houses of worship damaged or destroyed, 203, Israel two, ratio 100, is 100 to one. Kindergartens damaged or destroyed, Gaza Strip, 285, Israel one, ratio 285 is to one. Medical facilities damaged or destroyed, Gaza Strip, 73, Israel zero. Ratio 73 is to one. I mean, these are statistics that uh, speak, uh, speak for themselves. I just want to get one document quickly. Having a look at having a look at the genocide of the Palestinian people and an international law and human rights perspective. This is what is said by the Jewish Polish legal scholar Ra Raphael Lemkin. He says, more often genocide refers to a coordinated plan aimed at destruction of the essential foundations of the life of national groups so that these groups wither and die like plants that have suffered a blight. The end may be accomplished by the forced disintegration of the political and social institutions of the culture of the people of their language, their national feelings and their religion. It may be accomplished by wiping out all bases of personal security, liberty, health and dignity. When these means fail, the machine gun can always be utilized as a last resort. Genocide is directed against the national group 
as an entity and attack on individuals is only secondary to the annihilation of the national group to which they belong. And furthermore, at paragraph eight of this report, they go on to say that, please to note that settler colonial regimes are structurally prone. And I repeat this, settler colonial regimes are structurally, pro structurally prone to genocide and may indulge in genocidal moments when they become frustrated by the resistance of a colonized or occupied people. And I think this speaks for itself. Uh, the conclusion is that prominent human rights advocates and scholars have argued that the killings of Palestinians and their forceful expulsion from Mandate Palestine in 1948, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, and the violence and discrimination directed at Palestinians by the Israeli government have violated a number of human rights protections contained in international human rights law, genocide being among of them. Um, just, just giving the context, this is basically the context to the, the, the genocide uh, question. To, giving context to the genocide and why we're saying that, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a posit that Israel's accountability has not always, they have not always been accountable by international institutions. Uh, there has been some movement in 20, uh, there has been some movement recently by the ICC, the, that is the International Criminal Court, where the Palestine Authority of Palestine was accepted or were by means of ascension, accession uh, to the International Criminal Court. And then a preliminary investigation was undertaken by Fatou Ben Soda, uh, which almost took about five years in that preliminary investigation to determine whether war crimes, crimes against humanity were perpetrated against the Palestinian people uh, within the Palestinian territories. Uh, noting that this was also, the, uh, noting that that preliminary investigation was then referred to the ICC tribunal and the I three ICC judges then made a finding predominantly that finding constituted as follows, that Israel uh, would be investigated and that uh, criminal jurisdiction has been found uh, in the instance of war crimes that were perpetrated in occupied Palestinian territories. Um, Palestine had requested from the ICC that uh, crimes be investigated back to 2014, which was protective uh, Operation Protective Edge, uh, and that that process is now underway. Um, at the time when IPSRA was drafted, we had complete intransigence. And I think Comrade Manla spoke about that, that there's international institutions in both in local and, and at government level, that there's this intransigence towards the Palestinian cause, that people will speak towards Palestine, will support the Palestinian cause in rhetoric, but will not do anything of impactful nature. And this is where the IPSRA bill is basically structured or based. Um, so so that, that is a welcome decision by the ICC. And all that can happen out of there is that this can benefit IPSRA even further. We know that the United Nations um, has a difficult approach, uh, is not holding, despite the numerous resolutions and international conventions, uh, there's still intractability by the United Nations and by certain powers, states that carry the veto vote at the UN Security Council. Uh, that continues to protect and defend Israel. At the same token, those same nations are the ones that actually sell ammunitions and weapons of war to Israel, which are then uh, used on the Israeli people and vice versa, that we also have the circumstance where Israel is selling its own arms and ammunitions to countries like the United Kingdom and to European nations that in fact get battle tested in territories of the West Bank. So these are circumstances under which the Palestinian people are enduring despite the systematic uh, practices of apartheid and colonialism um, and the exodus of, of Palestinians from their land. Uh, we know that Palestinian prisoners are tortured um, uh, all the time, uh, that their rights, of uh, their rights or legal to legal representation have been taken away. Uh, the circumstances in Palestinian, uh, in Israeli prisons are dire. And of course, with the COVID pandemic, that does not assist 
uh, Palestinian prisoners in any way. So if we're going to take that kind of context with what I've spoken about in terms of the genocide, um, I think we make a strong case and we advocate strongly that as the Palestinian movement, we need to be taking this, uh, this cause uh, to a next dimension. And we need to be doing more as South Africans because of our own historical uh, legacy and because of apartheid and because of what we have endured. Uh, we have that experience and we should actually be at the forefront in defending and championing Palestinian human rights. So I, I, I want to basically end my discussion on the genocide question uh, there um, and then go on to the Ipsra bill and what the Ipsra bill entails. Um, just wanting to add that this is something that was written when we had done a protest action at the United States consulate, where you know the Palestine Solidarity Alliance had opposed uh, Trump's plan, which was the deal of the century. And you know, apart from the Judaization process that happens in Jerusalem, but granting status of, of Jerusalem to Israel uh, as the capital, that flagrantly violated international law, norms, and standards. But this is what I added in that petition and that memorandum. Um, prior to that, Magdalena Mukhrabi, Deputy Regional Director at Amnesty International said, for four weeks, the world has watched in horror as Israeli snipers and other soldiers in full protective gear and behind the fence have attacked Palestinian protesters with live ammunition and tear gas. Despite wide international condemnation, the Israeli army has not reversed it's illegal orders to shoot unarmed protesters. She added that the international community must act concretely and stop the delivery of arms and military equipment to Israel and that inaction would continue to fuel serious human rights abuses against thousands of men, women and children suffering the consequences of life under Israel's cruel blockade of Gaza. Israel is one of Washington's closest allies and a major buyer of US made military equipment but European Union nations, including France, Germany, the UK and Italy have licensed large volumes of military equipment for Israel. I, the reason I'm stating this is that we cannot expect BDS legislation to come from these so-called Western democratic states, especially when there's arms trades happening between the Zionist entity and those nation states. So we need to be able to, to take that cause forward and champion that cause uh, in a positive uh, direction. Uh, also making mention that we can advance the kind of uh, decisions that were made um, that, uh, at the United Nations Human Rights Council about listing certain companies that are operating within the occupied Palestinian territories and where those goods and services enter uh, into, a, uh, into our country, for instance, that they must be correctly labeled and there must be a register of companies that are, are trading in the OPTs so that they are uh, duly boycotted. Um, furthermore, during the meeting held in Geneva, multiple states and non-governmental organizations pushed for the publication of a database of all companies that conduct business directly or indirectly relating to Israeli settlements in occupied Palestinian territories. So, so we're seeing the pretext of IPSRA in my uh, discussion so far. Uh, we've spoken about genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, Palestinian prisoners' rights. Uh, to tell your viewers, uh, when I had went to the Human Rights Council in 2016, uh, we advanced a cause on Palestinian prisoners and predominantly Palestinian prisoners, ch children, Palestinian children who are being daily um, uh, accosted and daily being uh, abused by the Israeli police uh, in the way they go about things. Uh, for instance, if there's a, throw, a stone throwing, they are basically taken to the Israeli police station. They are refused any form of legal access to their children or to a lawyer. Um, and also the dire conditions of these Palestinian prisoners and Palestinian boys. Uh, for instance, children as young as uh, six years old are being uh, are being arrested. Uh, I've seen when I was in the Middle East, a clip of a boy that was actually two years old that just used the significance of resistance by picking up a stone against the Israeli occupying forces and they wanted to actually arrest this two-year-old boy. Of course, the little boy's parents were there and protested that action. 
So we're seeing this kind of conduct, this kind of behavior that is completely unacceptable. And we need to stand uh, firm and we need to be able to uh, and stop this kind of behavior. And one of the ways of doing that is to try and institutionalize our campaign in a way that says that South Africa will not accept what's going on and champion the human rights of Palestinians. And that's why we have the implementation and protection of Palestinian solidarity rights, uh, the Palestinian solidarity rights bill. Um, Comrade Eddie, are you still with me? Um, thank you for that. Um, are you ready to give the um, actual PowerPoint presentation that you were talking about? Yes. Yes, I would like to. Uh, I would like to do the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, go through that with uh, viewers, and then uh, we can take uh, we can take it from from there. After that, I just want to try and share that screen. Okay, can everybody see that, Comrade Eddie? Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, this is this is the IPSRA bill, and I will go through some of the contents of the IPSRA bill, what I it's what it entails. Uh, the text I would suggest that uh, viewers who are keen and interested, it can be circulated. It's very difficult to discuss on a webinar uh, the text of the bill, uh, but it is available upon request, and we can go through that as well at the appropriate time. Uh, just to introduce what IPSRA is about. Um, what is IPSRA? So IPSRA, coming back to it, is not only BDS legislation. It is an all-encompassing legislation against the Zionist entity. And at the forefront of this legislation is the advocacy of lawfare and utilizing the legal mechanisms of lawfare as a resistance tool. That is using the law to hold Israel accountable for its actions but also taking that further and advancing lawfare to the aspect of saying um, that we are going to now institutionalize BDS as well as institutionalize important legislation with regard to South African citizens, for instance, going to serve in the IDF, uh, or for instance, giving um, um, you know, prerogative or privilege to Israeli state leaders who come to South Africa, who get protected under the Diplomatic and Immunities Privileges Act. Uh, so IPSRA sits in that position with current uh, legislation in South Africa that we already have, as well as our implementation and protection of, uh, in, as well as the, our implementation of the International Criminal Court Act when we ratified the Rome Statute, and also the Foreign Military Assistance Act uh, uh, addressed to that is the prohibition of mercenary activities. So we do have acts and legislation already in place that is all encompassing in general to any kind of crimes that are perpetrated uh, where South Africa may exercise criminal jurisdiction. Um, added to that is we must look at our trade laws, for instance. It's not, a, it's not novel for South Africa, for the South African minister, for instance, to implement trade laws and import tariffs, for instance, in a, in a, in a situation where you have uh, a certain state uh, dispute and certain goods and services coming from a particular country where the trade minister can impose an import tariff uh, on those goods and then avoid those goods coming actually into the state and that causing some form of sanction or penalty. Um, so what is IPSRA? Just to go through it, uh, IPSRA is the tool of resistance. Was adopt Lawfare was adopted as a legitimate policy tool at the NGO Forum of the UN World Conference Against Racism in Durban. Palestinian NGOs around the world are effectively deploying this tactic for the first time, where Israeli government is facing serious allegations of war crimes. Um, there has been some question about lawfare, the correct approach and application of lawfare, and we heard from Comrade Manla and his support of lawfare. It is an important tool for Palestinians who are confronted with by a superior military power of the Israeli state. Global lawfare can defeat belligerent occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid. What is the lawfare context to advance the Palestinian cause? I have already spoken about this, so just very quickly. It's advocacy in utilizing legitimate policy tools, including legal mechanisms and customary or criminal universal jurisdiction against present and former Israeli leaders and military commanders who either hold political or executive or military office with command line responsibility. 
who are accountable for the most egregious crimes and abominable international crimes perpetrated against Palestinian civilians and activists. And it includes genocide, ethnic cleansing. There's no doubt that the 1948 exodus of Palestinians was ethnic cleansing. Um, I think that is now um, accepted in our law and accepted by scholars that that was perpetrated ethnic cleansing and genocide. The Gaza war crimes, we've only spoken about uh, Operation Protective Age in 2014. I was also a member on uh, an, an attorney that had prepared the Gaza topic in 2008, 2009. Um, there was a group of, uh, of, of legal experts, legal, legal people from South Africa that went to Egypt. Uh, the Rafa border was closed. But when the Rafa border had opened, there was a hospital, a field hospital, where doctors uh, tended to the wounded in, in, in the Gaza Strip. And some of the doctors had taken photographs of some of the victims of the war that was uh, unleashed in 2009. Um, and personally, uh, quoting Norman Finkelstein, the descriptive uh, sense of, of the kind of crime that is perpetrated against children, uh, you know, they, we saw photographs of babies who were killed, babies who were blasted away by these heavy munitions of time bombs and, uh, and different kinds of white phosphorus and other serious munitions that were used in a densely populated area and completely horrendous crimes. Uh, to, and, and to see that these children had no future, their futures basically being snatched away. So, so this is something that has been going on um, and definitely the crimes of aggression. Uh, the application of international, so lawfare, but, also uh, entails also uh, of uh, international. Um, is it a request that you put the presentation on full screen? I think people's screens are different sizes, so if you could put it on to full screen. Thank you. Uh, okay, how do I do that? Um, uh, Lutri, could you come in there? Let me see if I can, sorry. Is that better? No, it hasn't made any difference. Oh, the glass icon bottom right. Glass icon, yeah. Yes, that one. It is this one, yeah. Oh. Okay. There, there you go, yes. Thank you. Okay, so how do I scroll then up and down? Oh, okay, all right. Okay, I'll figure it out. Thanks, Comrade Eddie. Okay, so um, may I carry on? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so speaking about lawfare, the context to advance the Palestinian cause, um, we also talk about the application of international conventions and resolutions, which declare the perpetration of such criminal conduct a violation of international law and international humanitarian law. So always when we look at the lawfare context, it's about holding those accountable for the most egregious crimes perpetrated with impunity. And that's within the context of current international law, international humanitarian law. And I think that's where the issue of um, the Khadija David's case was very prominent, is that Khadija was on the flotilla vessel as part and parcel of an international community of people wanting to go and uh, unbreak the siege in Gaza, which has been ongoing since 2007, I believe. And at that time, uh, that siege and an embargo, um, that embargo actually goes against international human rights and the San Remo manual and naval law, for instance. So there always needs to be access to rights of movement, access to the needs of the occupied people uh, being tended to by the occupied in terms of the international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions. Uh, so that's where the context of law comes in. Uh, this is just a slide to show, this is currently what has been going on. I work with an organization called the Right of Return, the Global Campaign for the Right of Return. This was in 2015, Israeli settlers storm Al-Aqsa Mosque, protected by Israeli forces and Palestinian worshippers stand up against them and defend the mosque. And we know that this is the continuous situation with Palestinians on the one end and Israeli police on the other end, fully equipped in full gear um, and trying to, um, you know, um, trying to abuse Palestinians and take control of their land and all the different kinds of problems that they have within those communities. So moving forward, why IPSRA policy? It's a state response by South Africa forcing Israel to alter its current policies 
violating fundamental Palestinian human rights. EPSRA is an impactful lawfare initiative, strengthening international intifada. That's the international resistance for other state jurisdictions to build comparative solidarity, creating a domestic legislative and regulatory framework as a state institutionalized response, development of the international intifada of resistance through peaceful means. So as much as we talk about lawfare and the utilization of law as a weapon of law, lawfare is a peaceful means of resistance and it's a resistance tool. And why? It's because of the bias and intractable international institutions like the UN and the ICC in enforcement of international law against the party state of Israel. And I would qualify that with the most recent decision that was now made by the ICC tribunal that they have found jurisdiction, there is criminal jurisdiction, and that the five-year preliminary investigation into the occupied Palestinian territories will be taken forward, whereby uh, Israel can now be held accountable by the ICC. Of course, Israel and the United States will do all in its power to avoid that process by any means, what's, uh, by any means whatsoever. Interestingly, uh, the manner in which criminal jurisdiction was found was in terms of a general assembly resolution by the United Nations, which spoke about the recognition of the Palestinian people's right to self-determination and that certain occupied territories being the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip uh, being occupied Palestinian territories in East Jerusalem within the 1967 borders and based on that by the accession of Palestine to the International Criminal Court for criminal jurisdiction, the decision was made to now investigate Israel for war crimes. So I'm saying that uh, when I prepared the slide, there was so previous to that decision by the ICC. We know the ICC gave a, uh, was not in favor of the Freedom Flotilla, which was also submitted to the ICC through the state of Comoros, being the registered uh, sea naval vessel. Uh, and there they found that it wasn't agree, uh, you know, the gravity element was not complied with. Hence, um, you know, the ICC prosecutor had decided not to, um, not to investigate in, under those circumstances. However, we know by utilizing the law in our country and utilizing the application for the, of the International Criminal Court Act and our laws on crim criminal law and universal jurisdiction, we held uh, Khadija David's case was successful where uh, four Israeli commanders, if they had to come to South Africa, would be placed on red alert and would be extradited to Turkey to face uh, war crimes charges for their atrocities committed on the Freedom Flotilla, uh, the Mavi Marmara. So this is where how we utilize the legal mechanisms in trying to hold Israel account accountable. Uh, it's not all encompassing advocacy legislation, which includes BDS, political cessation of severance, uh, severance of ties with the party Israel. That's a fundamental that we want to have complete cessation of political ties with the apartheid state of Israel. Development of lawfare mechanisms in upholding international human rights, accountability of South Africans serving in the IDF. We know that this is a problem and IPSTA also serves to deal with this particular issue of, uh, of, an, an, of an investigation and enforcement mechanism whereby IDF soldiers are recruited who are South African citizens and South African citizens that actually, um, excuse me, South African citizens that um, are, need to comply with our constitutional provisions in this country as good South Africans, but get recruited by the IDF and then go and serve in the IDF uh, in wars that are unleashed in the Gaza Strip. So IPSA brings this to an end. And why IPSRA? It's an avenue for justice to victims. Um, the preamble is quite detailed. It gives a historical context um, and it's supported by appendices and annexures. I want to also acknowledge the PSC Cape Town for their contribution on IPSRA, where they speak about the Israeli genocide of Palestinians, as well as the report by Advocate A. Solomon on the situation in Bethlehem and Palestinian Christians. Uh, coming back to the preamble, South Africa has a responsibility because of its own settler colonial history and crime of apartheid. We know apartheid is a crime against humanity. Uh, the historical geo geopolitical context, record of violations by apartheid Israel, international law and UN resolutions. IPSRA means for South Africa meeting its international obligations. This is extremely important because our constitutional provisions 
say that when it comes to international law, our law must be interpreted in favor of international law. Uh, I know a question came up within one of the solidarity activists, how can we expect IPSRA to be passed on the basis of probably uh, of South Africa not having signed the anti-apartheid convention. Um, I mean, that, that, that South Africa should sign the anti-apartheid convention and there's no two ways about it. They need to sign it, uh, especially because South Africa was a victim to apartheid, South Africans, for instance. But we must also understand that we have a new constitutional dispensation in this country and that our interpretation of international law must be, cons uh, our laws must be read to be consistent with international law. Customary international law, however, if it's a diverted from our local law or domestic law, it's a different issue. So very important that South Africa is a signatory to the Rome Statute and has domesticated, we've domesticated the implementation of the ICC Act. And IPSRA, this is the most important aspect I think Comrade Manla uh, uh, referred to it as well. And I say it very clearly in the IPSRA bill is that we talk about the conversion of political rhetoric holding the South African government accountable in upholding its international obligations. Um, IPSRA also has appendices, uh, appendices and annex shares. We look at the policy considerations of the 53rd National Conference of the ANC on International Relations, uh, the 2017 ANC Conference supporting downgrade of Israeli embassy, which was reaffirmed by our state president and other cabinet ministers, and also the Human Rights Council adopts a resolution and closes its 31st regular session. That was a session that I had attended uh, and had spoken on Palestinian prisoners' rights. And out of that uh, contribution, uh, there was a resolution that said that uh, Israel was, must be held accountable for its violation against Palestinian prisoners and must stop all kinds of violations against Palestinian prisoners and adhere to international, uh, international humanitarian law and international law in that regard. What is IPSRA? It's a Future Solidarity Rights Act. It's a, a citizen's bill an advocacy bill standing with the oppressed people of Palestine to restore their fundamental human rights to life, dignity, and equality. It's the first of its kind, conversion of political rhetoric and posturing into a constructive legal and regulatory framework. And what's important is that we create a council in IPSRA and it's in the section of the bill uh, which can be looked at and it's called the Boycotts, Trade Divestments, Economic Sanctions and Lawfare Council. I know it's a bit of a long abbreviation we can just call it the boycotts and lawfare council. This is a regulate. Uh, this is a statutory regulatory body that we want created that should have members of ministers and uh, department of, of and um, members of departments of ministries. Uh, and then we've also need uh, members from civil society activists and advocates and attorneys uh, on this particular regulatory body uh, that will deal with particular issues with regard to the implementation of IPSRA via the issuing of regulations by the minister. Uh, and, and that kind of power sits with the Minister of International Trade and Cooperation. Um, also, we talk about the breaking of diplomatic trade and economic relations with Israel within a period to be determined upon the recommendations of this lawfare council. Now, why do we need this kind of regulation? We are not saying that South Africa must just cease ties with Israel we're asking for this lawfare council, the boycotts council, to look and consider the different political dynamics, the economic dynamics, the situation of the country, and how best to be able to divest from any form of relationship with Israel, including any arms deals that may occur with Israel, and any kind of economic dealing so that the state can get alternative economic uh, partners, uh, the, the, the impact of this kind of legislation uh, is less severe or mitigated by a, a, a measured approach and a tiered approach in the way uh, IPSRA is implemented. So this is upon IPSRA having been implemented and enacted uh, at Parliament. Uh, we also talk about the legal enabling framework and utilization of present legislation, including ratification of the Rome Statute and lawfare mechanisms. Uh, because of Israeli repressive and oppressive apartheid policies and practices, its war crimes, the stifling blockades and siege, uh, sieges imposed on Gaza, uh, belligerent occupation affecting peace initiatives in the Middle East, illegal and unlawful expansion settlement policies, and this is also in contravention of UN Resolution 2334 and Israel's continued breaches of international law, torture conventions. We know Palestinian prisoners are also being tortured 
international humanitarian law, civil and political human rights. Um, how will it be undertaken? By passing IPSRA le legislation and regulation to be promulgated, fulfilling international criminal and customary, customary law obligations, and abiding with the Criminal Procedure Act, our domestic laws, universal jurisdiction. Uh, and importantly, we've got IPSA speaks about the foreign regulation of the foreign, foreign Military Assistance Act. And we also have the Prohibition of Mercenary Activities Act, which has a bit of a higher, a lower threshold than the Foreign Military Assistance Act. And IPSA is there to support these particular acts when it comes to any form of recruitment of, uh, of South African citizens, particularly South African youth, uh, into the Zionist army. Um, at the time when Khadija Davids had given her testimony aboard the Mahabi Mamara, she had attested to the fact that most of the foot soldiers or the Navy that was aboard from the Israeli Defense Force were young people that we know Israel recruits from across the world through their different campaigns and through uh, institutions that have been formed uh, for this kind of recruitment. And we're saying that if IPSRA is passed here and we set the example, it becomes a kind of legislation for other countries to follow suit uh, and to implement in other countries. And in that way, uh, to hold these leaders, these Israeli Zionist leaders accountable and to actually close the net on them and also for their recruitment process, including the economics and divestments and sanctions, uh, uh, sanctions that would be applied. Um, we also talk about amendment of the Diplomatic Immunities, Rights and Privileges Act. So there won't be this issue of any uh, state leader from the Knesset coming to South Africa who was part and parcel of any war, excuse me, any war that was in, uh, that, that, that they played their part um, as a part of the IDF and they come to South Africa and accept to be treated with, um, you know, with kid gloves. We would have then this kind of legislation uh, kick in. And it is possible. Um, again, we see Masjid al-Aqsa, we see Jerusalem, we see um, the kind of Israeli, um, you know, outposts um, always there, always lurking in the background, always showing themselves also to Palestinians and that they're living under these conditions. Section seven is this Lawfare Council. What are its focus areas? It's constituted by the Minister of Trade and Industry, 30 members across government, business and civil society, nine members, attorneys and advocates to advise and inform, lawfare mechanisms to look, be looked at, and also to look at the risk analysis, which I spoke about earlier. And what sectors does it uh, impact on? Trade, industrial and economic, sporting, cultural and religious, academic collaboration, environmental, water and energy, arms trade and munitions. So this is the kind of lawfare regulation that we would be looking at. And we can look further into that, um, into that particular um, you know, lawfare council. I just want to go to that. I uh, just want to do a correction. I think the minister will be, the minister for this one would be, for the Lawfare Council, would be either the Minister of Trade and Industry or the Minister for International Relations and Cooperation. I think there's a bit of a correction for that, but we can look at that um, as well. Um, again, I spoke about Magdalena Mukrabi and the Deputy Regional Director at Amnesty International. And we spoke about Washington as being one of Israel's closest allies. So we cannot accept that any of these countries would in any way whatsoever pass this kind of legislation that would hold Israel accountable or that would stop any forms of arms trade. And that's particularly the problem is the arms trade. It's the arms trade that causes the problems in the wars that are being unleashed in the occupied Palestinian territories like the Gaza Strip. Uh, also, we have the courts here. Um, courts have powers of, to interdict or to review and set aside. And that's any form of trade or commercial activities by the South African based companies, multinational corporations based within the Republic of or South African companies trading elsewhere with its principal place of business or its registered address offices within the Republic that conducts business with the state of Israel. Uh, the High Court would have powers to interdict or set a review or set aside any commercial trade agreements with the state of Israel, which are concluded contrary to IPSRA Act any sporting, cultural, or religious agreement or academic collaboration activity between universities and other institutions 
which may be contrary to the purport of the act. And I think when it comes to the boycott's perspective, what's important is that we're not asking for when it comes to collaboration between institutions and that, is that we have a problem when it's Israeli institutions that are funded by the Zionist regime and there's collaboration between those kind of institutions and institutions in South Africa. So these are issues that needs to be discussed, uh, looked into further, but it is already created in the draft IPSRA bill. And again, it rests, these questions rest with this boycotts and divestments in lawfare council to come up with the proper regulations in this regard. Um, we also speak about by specialized courts in the high court and what kinds of power that they may have, um, any to, to powers of review of any bilateral trade agreement. So anything that comes to the state of Israel, there has to be a, a, a greater tier of accountability within the IPSRA legislation. And, it, um, and also we must consider the provisions of the Administrative Justice Act budget and administrative law, uh, but particularly that Israel must be accountable and they, they, this, this court can issue warrants of arrest for accused persons in pursuit of investigations at the court, as, as the court may direct or deem necessary. And this is not something that's new because we already have these, uh, this kind of administrative, uh, of the uh, uh, specialized organs of state like the National Prosecuting Authorities Hawks Unit, uh, which is called the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit that deals with specialized war crimes and so forth. Um, also to interdict accused persons from leaving the Republic pending an investigation, which may be contemplated in the act. The Minister of Safety and Security and the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development must create the necessary enabling environment in order for the relevant authorities and courts to carry out its functions and duties as provided. Uh, these are some of the offenses and penalties. A natural person would, would be fined with, with an amount of up to 300,000 rand or five years a juristic person, I think we've increased to 1 million, imprisonment of its directors for five years, penalties, arms manufacturers to be determined by the minister. Um, what's important is corporations and multinational companies, immediate trade suspension, license revocation, sporting, cultural, religious, educational, environmental, water and waste management, collaboration exchanges upon the recommendations of this boycotts and lawfare council uh, with regulations to be promulgated by the minister. And I just wanted to correct it that the minister that we speak about is the minister uh, for international relations and cooperation uh, within which this intergovernmental approach and interministerial approach will be applied. Um, so, so that's what we're looking at in terms of section 10 of for offenses and penalties. Uh, this is the coordination and cooperative governance between ministries and departments uh, and organs of state. We've got home affairs, trade and industry, arts and culture, education, science and technology, uh, water and environmental affairs, sports and recreation, um, and also departments and organs of state, again, presidency, office of the president, international relations and cooperation, safety and security, justice and constitutional development, and particularly we'll have the high courts and special courts, the South African police services or would be involved in this kind of uh, action is the priority crimes investigation unit, DEPC, and from a prosecution perspective, the priority crimes litigation unit. Um, other important considerations, promulgation of regulations by the minister, offenses and penalties, transitional regulation section 11, cooperative governance section 12, and then once again, doing away with the diplomatic immunity and privileges, the resolutive conditions in section 13. Um, also, I wanted to speak about challenges, um, you know, sorry, just one minute. Uh, to other jurisdictions, it challenges the apartheid Zionist regime globally and will achieve the defeat of apartheid Israel, gives back dignity and freedom to Palestinians, redresses violations of the past, including right of return and other alienated Palestinian rights, strengthens a global campaign for the respect of fundamental human rights where there are habitual transgressions. Um, these are important quotes by, for instance, Oliver yeah. Tambo. We know Oliver can I stall with can I, Yes. Yeah, let's ask yes. you to, to, to wrap up your presentation. Okay, thank you, Eddie. I'm almost done, almost completed. Uh, we've got Oliver Tambo, we know that he, steered the anti-apartheid movement during the darkest age, uh, darkest years 
of South Africa. And these are important quotations from him. Um, our watchword must be mobilization, organization struggle. All our people must be mobilized into action. All our people must be organized for action. All our people must engage in struggle. That must be our reply to the enemy's desperate counteroffensive. Um, the, the fight for freedom. This is my favorite one. The fight for freedom must go on until it's won, until our country is free and happy and peaceful as part of the community of men, we cannot rest. And I would end with saying that we cannot rest until uh, Palestinians are free. Uh, conclusion on the Ipsra bill, it creates a culture for change towards a new democratic and constitutional world order. Uh, it forces Israel to change its political uh, dimension and its political composition that uh, violates and, uh, Palestinian rights. And it forces Israel to relook at its own internal politics and in the way uh, it's framed its Zionist policies uh, against uh, Palestinians. Palestine and South Africa become models for peaceful, democratic, and revolutionary change. It forces reform of the ICC and other UN structures. Uh, importantly, that IPSRA and LAWFIC can serve complementary with international institutions and structures and can force those institutions, those international institutions, to restructure, especially uh, from and shift them from the current position of intractability. Um, resolution 2334 is very important. We know it again reaffirms findings by the, that the state of Israel, that settlements in the Palestinian occupied territories since 67, including East Jerusalem, have no legal validity and constitutes a vagrant violation under international law. Um, so that, uh, Comrade Eddie, I would leave it at that. Uh, we also had the status of Jerusalem and international conventions on this. Uh, but we know that I think the context has been given within which Palestinians operate and why there's the importance uh, for the Ipsra bill. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much for your um, presentation and input. Um, it's clearly a, a wonderful um, work that has been put in to deliver this uh, um, bill, draft bill that is, um, for Palestinian um, activists. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Comrade Jamia just to uh, address us uh, from the PSC side and why it is that we are um, in support of this, this, this bill. And then we'll go open over to some questions uh, for, the, for the panel. Jamia. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Good evening and assalamu alaikum to everyone. Phew, I'm tired of the listening to that and I'm not sure whether um, uh, people will listen to me, but I've got a very, very short uh, input, as you said, uh, a, a kind of statement in support uh, of this initiative. So thank you to the organizers for affording me this opportunity to share my reflections. Um, if like me, you spent the past week in webinars organized as part of Israeli Apartheid Week 2021, you would have heard a range of local and international speakers, including the speakers before me in this webinar, articulate and detail the decades long repression and atrocities that the Zionist state of Israel has meted out against the Palestinian people. I will not be going into that level of detail. But I have to say the tragedy of listening to the historical trajectory of what can only be described as incremental genocide or as genocide, uh, um, as the others put it, against the Palestinians, is that there is little indication that this trajectory is going to change course in the, new, in the near future. And I say this because despite the fact that the United Nations the so-called watchdog of human rights atrocities in the world, as Ziad again has, has detailed for us, has adopted numerous resolutions to hold Israel to account for its flagrant violations of international human rights law. Yet Israel has continued to act with systemic impunity to realize its vision of a Zionist Jewish state at the expense of all its Palestinian citizens, including those in the occupied territories. The UN, as we know, has commissioned and received reports in 2008, in 2009, and 2014 
from independent fact-finding missions into war atrocities committed by Israel in Gaza and the occupied territories. And all of these reports have affirmed Israel's culpability in committing war crimes against the Palestinians. The UN resolution adopted by the Security Council in 2016, which uh, Ziad uh, just showed in his second last slide, unequivocally condemns the ongoing establishment of Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories and which the UN rightly recognizes as an attempt by Israel to establish a one state reality on the ground, that being the one Zionist Jewish state of Israel. While we know that the so-called two state solution was never a viable and just solution for Palestinians, it has always been deliberately undermined by Israel itself, despite its own rhetorical allegiance to it. The truth as we know it is that the colonial genocide of the Palestinian people by the Israeli regime supported by Western imperial powers has continued unabated for over seven decades, starting in 1946. If the UN and the ICC to date have been toothless, I say toothless, uh, Zihad says intractable, in holding Israel to account or bringing its colonial occupation to an end, it is not surprising that over these same decades, the Palestinian resistance forces and the global Palestine solidarity movement has been unable to significantly shift the balance of forces towards the liberation of Palestine. It is only in recent years, since the increasing consolidation of the global BDS campaign against Israel, that Israel and its allies have begun to feel some pressure, not pressure to change its colonial and genocidal tactics, but pressure to fight back. This is manifested, for example, not only in Israel banning BDS campaigners from entry to Israel, but also in the adoption of anti-BDS legislation by several states in the US and countries like Canada, Austria, Germany, Spain, and the Netherlands, to name a few. Elsewhere, anti-BDS legislations and policies have been couched in anti-Semitism laws or policies, equating the BDS campaign to an anti-Semite campaign. In fact, anti-Semitism has become the dominant discourse of attack against BDS campaigners in recent times. These policy and legislative responses are indicative of the recognition that a successful global BDS campaign poses a serious threat to the Zionist project of Israel. Indeed, it is this threat that inspired the call for a global BDS campaign against Israel from Palestinian civil society themselves. It is a campaign calling not only for solidarity with Palestinians, but also a campaign to act against Israel. Inspired by the success of the global anti-apartheid movement against South Africa, BDS is a call to action to put pressure on the Israeli state to end the occupation and restore the land dignity and human rights of all Palestinians. We should never forget that the freedoms and democracy that we enjoy in our country, South Africa today, however flawed, are the beneficiaries not only of our local relentless freedom fighters, but also beneficiaries of the success of the global anti-apartheid solidarity movement that campaigned for the end of apartheid for over 40 years, from the 1960s to the 1990s, until the demise of the apartheid regime in South Africa. It was this global solidarity movement that gradually eroded the legitimacy of the apartheid state internationally, that isolated the apartheid state economically from world trade, politically from diplomatic relations, and socially from any global sports and cultural activities. This is what the BDS campaign against Israel strives to achieve. Israel must become the pariah state of the world. It must be delegitimized as a sovereign state and isolated economically, politically, socially, 
and culturally. And like Ziad said, it must be held accountable for its, for its war atrocities. All of this, I believe, can only happen through a sustained global solidarity BDS campaign. It took the international anti-apartheid movement 40 years of campaigning to end apartheid. The BDS movement against Israel was launched by Palestinians 21 years ago in 2005. And while its voice is less muted internationally today, to date, it has had little effect on the global status or economic and political prosperity of Israel. The key lesson learned from the international anti-apartheid movement is that it was the solidarity campaigns of civil society organizations across the globe that eventually pressured their governments and institutions to legislate BDS against South Africa, whether it was economic sanctions or sports and cultural boycotts. The states, the governments created policies to bring these into effect. So too, we in South Africa, I think have reached the point in our Palestinian solidarity campaigns where we have to do more to pressure our government to legislate BDS against Israel. If countries and institutions can legislate anti-BDS laws and policies, then we should call for the reverse and call for legislating BDS laws and policies against Israel. We can be global trendsetters in this regard. Our ruling party, the ANC, has long expressed its supportive relationship of the Palestinian liberation struggle, reinforced regularly by ANC conference resolutions. We hear it every year. However, our government to date has done little significant to support the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. It has only recently gone so far as downgrading its embassy in Israel to a liaison officer, office. The latter, according to President Ramaphosa, and I quote, leaves open the space to oversee our continuing provision of consular services and any trade and economic relations, close quote. In other words, the government has shown no intent to support the global BDS campaign against Israel. It is unacceptable and a betrayal for the ruling ANC to shirk its moral responsibility and, as Ziad put it, international uh, obligations of meaningly supporting the liberation of Palestine through the BDS campaign. The reluctance of our government to act decisively against Israel and to insist on the rhetoric of a two-state solution ultimately makes them and us complicit in the ongoing repression and genocide of the Palestinians. There is little doubt that the BDS campaign in South Africa will be most effective if, if it is enforced through legislation and supported by the South African government. We have witnessed how ineffectual PSC or BDS SA calls for consumer boycotts of Israeli products or companies have been and our calls for academic sports and cultural boycotts against Israeli institutions have been resisted. Without legislative and state support, BDS efforts in South Africa will put little pressure on Israel to end the occupation. We need our government not only to legislate BDS against Israel, but also lobby other countries to follow suit. It is unconscionable that our government continues to seek to normalize relations with Israel, especially through trade agreements. And even within civil society, we seek to normalize relations with, with Israel. How, for example, is it that we have had at least five former Bafana Bafana players who have played in the Israeli PFL and no one blinks an eye? The draft Ipsra bill, which Ziad has presented um, very comprehensively to us today could be the starting point for focusing our BDS campaigns towards the legislative arena, where its effects could be more directly felt by Israel. The bill in its current form is very ambitious, as, as you would have seen, but if presented to Parliament, it at least has the potential to force a conversation amongst lawmakers about how best 
to formulate and implement not only BDS laws and policies against Israel, but also holding Israel account for its war atrocities against the people of Palestine. It also presents an opportunity to mobilize more of civil society in support of BDS legislation against Israel. No doubt, we will also have to gather all our defenses against the onslaught of resistance that will come from the powerful Zionist lobby groups in our country. This, however, should not deter us in our efforts to support the struggle of Palestinians for the end of the brutal Israeli occupation and their struggle for justice and self-determination. We can do this best by pressurizing our government to legislate BDS against Israel and hold them accountable for their war atrocities. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Shania. That's a wonderful presentation, very insightful. Um, I'm just considering time now. I think we've really kind of exhausted much of our time for this evening. There are a, a few questions maybe we can address um, very, very quickly. Um, to the, I think maybe any of the panelists can maybe um, answer this. Um, how best do we popularize what Ziad is presenting and develop a grounds up approach is one question. Um, another question is, uh, what can the international community do to amplify this legislative initiative? And then generally, how do we take the, the BDS campaign forward? Um, I'll leave it open to um, any of you to maybe answer. Um, Eddie, I think there's a, there's a good response from Martin in the chat, um, which says that um, both P PSC as well as um, SABDS coalition um, will attempt to draft a kind of a plan of action um, after this. And the plan of action has to include the awareness campaigns, the education around this, uh, and to pick up on some of the points that that uh, Ziad spoke about in, in terms of explaining to people how focusing a BDS campaign in this way sh can, shift, uh, can shift the goalposts um, and, and uh, you know, work towards a greater impact, uh, particularly in terms of putting that pressure on Israel uh, as opposed to you know, only um, expressing our solidarity uh, with the Palestinians and not actually having an impact uh, on, on Israel in that way. Okay, no, good. Um, and of course, we need to add, um, you need to join the PSC <laughs> to take the cycle forward. Um, I think there's a lot of- That's uh, a good point, yeah. You know, asking very good questions and are interested in this topic. Um, it's really a milestone, I think, in the development of BDS internationally, that we have this uh, wonderful document before us. Of course, it's not the end of the process, it is the first kind of public engagement um, on the IPSA bill. It will go through another process of engagement and uh, we'll be engaging on strategy. So Ziad, I'm going to give you the last say in tonight's um, webinar. And maybe a question from my side as the chair, and you maybe picked up some other questions which you can maybe add as well is, the question really is, it is an all and encompassing and thorough document. Uh, you've even written the, the bill up for the state. Um, the question I think in many activists' mind is, we've been struggling just to, to kind of deal with, for example, uh, the IDF question of the Africans going to war and murdering uh, Palestinians. How then do we think we will have to take forward the IPSA bill, which is a much bigger um, project, and what are the possibilities of taking this forward? Over to you. Thanks, uh, Comrade. Thank you, Comrade Eddie. Uh, before I respond to you, I also want to say thank you to Jamia for her excellent uh, presentation and analysis on, uh, on the discussion. Uh, greatly appreciated. 
Uh, just coming to the first question about, um, you know, internationally and propelling this kind of process uh, internationally. Uh, this is what lawfare advocacy is about. And I think we need to be clear in our, some of our terminology that whilst we speak about BDS legislation, uh, IPSRA, IPSRA, the IPSRA bill, BDS legislation is just one component of many other components. And I've said this to a previous, um, in a previous webinar or a previous discussion with some of the comrades, is that uh, whatever is happening in civil society within the BDS movement must continue and it's excellent work. And despite, you know, we can, we can be critical about how effective has BDS been. Um, you know, in my travels to the Middle East, uh, I know Palestinians consider BDS as the most potent weapon in the arsenal to fight against the Zionist entity. But out of that development is also this lawfare uh, initiatives in holding war criminals accountable. Um, so in my detailed outline of IPSRA, we spoke about five objectives, the cessation of diplomatic ties with Israel. We speak about uh, holding South Africans accountable for not going to serve the IDF. There's five objectives and I'm saying that as an activist, uh, you know, more than being a professional advocate or an attorney is that I'm also an activist for Palestine, is to say that there are five non-negotiables because of the genocide and because of the historical geopolitical conflict and because of the historical context of genocide against Palestinians, is that we want the South African parliament to consider IPSRA as it stands and the bill as it's drafted, but of course that it needs to go through a parliamentary process. Um, so part of lawfare and being a lawfare advocate is to, to develop this kind of initiative across multi-jurisdictions so that if for instance it's done in South Africa, you know, it can be done in Canada, Australia. Uh, we know in Canada there's also an initiative to hold uh, Canadian youngsters, youth that go and serve in the IDF and there can be some kind of collaboration between us and, them, uh, and, and activists in Canada. So that's how we can propel it forward is to have this uh, cross-jurisdictional, um, you know, a lawfare advocacy in holding our government's institutions and international institutions um, accountable. Um, sorry, uh, comrade, Eddie, just, just give me the brief of what you asked me, your question, just yeah, to recall. Very, very quickly. Um, the BDS yeah. movement has been struggling, for example, in South Africa, just to ensure that the so African government enforces um, the prosecution of South Africans joining oh, yes. the IDF, all right? Okay. That yeah. hasn't um, happened in a way as we thought would be possible. The concern okay. I think, from many activists out there globally and locally be, this of course is a milestone in terms of the development of BDS and BDS, sorry, not BDS alone, but the broader IPSRA uh, lawfare, uh, what are the grounds, for example, uh, for it actually taking off? Noting yes. kinds of struggles that have already been undertaken on some of these issues. Yes, sir, I, sir, I recall the question now. Um, yeah, so the, first, so the first part of that question about, uh, you know, I mean, for instance, um, when we prepared the Gaza docket in 2008, 2009, uh, some of the, uh, you know, professionals that were involved in it, uh, we didn't even know that South Africa had ratified the Rome Statute. And there was actually, a, you know, the implementation of the International Criminal Court Act that was lying there and not being utilized. And I think when the Gaza docket was prepared, we were one of the first countries, uh, we were actually one of the first cases, apart from the Zimbabwean Exile Forum, which eventually that case went to the Constitutional Court, that started utilizing the Rome statute. And, and, our, our, and, and we had passed that kind of legislation. Um, what was the expectation that a South African citizen, Khadija from Cape Town, Khadija Davids, who was aboard the Mavi Mamra in international waters, uh, and then uh, crimes were perpetrated against her, and that the South African government through the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit and the DEPSI, the South African Police Services, would actually hold those war criminals accountable, the Israeli war commanders that initiated the uh, Freedom Flotilla attack. And there was actually this amazing collaboration between our South African authorities and the Turkish authorities. And I recall at the time, 
me going many times to Turkey and listening to the case that was unfolding there and coming back and having Khadija go to testify in the Turkish criminal court. Um, what was the expectation at the time when we drafted that complaint that there would any be, be any benefit? So, so you know, I, what I said earlier in the presentation is that we do have laws on the statute book and those laws can be utilized in a successful and in a proactive way that advances the Palestinian cause. Um, what IPSRA does is it basically supports that kind of legislation and it actually focuses particularly not on any other country but the Zionist state of Israel because we want the Zionist state of Israel to, 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 to change its policies, to change its political Zionist ideology that uh, of, of Judaization and of, of, of this kind of suppression of everyone else but themselves. And doing this, um, and, 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 and doing this through kind of legislation that we've, we've, we've created great advocacy. So I would say, um, I mean, there are cases currently in South Africa that are being investigated where South Africans have went and served in the IDF and we've used and utilized the Foreign Military Assistance Act, which I spoke about earlier. So Comrade Eri, um, I think, you know, our authorities, we, we need to treat them with a bit more of understanding and with a bit more, um, you know, in a way to say that we shouldn't undermine their ability to do things for us in the Palestinian cause because they have done things for us in the past. And um, IPSRA is exactly that kind of initiative that if it sparks uh, a certain, um, you know, in a, a, a certain interest within uh, the political groups and parliamentarians and there's this political will to take it forward, we just see a completely new dimension happening in advancement of advocacy rights for Palestinians, but not only for Palestinians in the Middle East, but every other human rights cause where there are fundamental breaches and contravention of international law. So we've got to continue being optimistic and asking the most of our, our government because of our constitutional um, uh, you know, responsibilities and for us to be upholding international norms and standards as an international state and as a party to, uh, you know, to the international community. Okay, thank you so much for the response. Welcome back, Comrade Mandla. I see you have your hand up. May I, may I ask you to maybe uh, make the last remark for this, this webinar this evening? And thank you. Uh, Comrade Eddie, and uh, let me also take this opportunity to appreciate the input that has been uh, made both by uh, Sister Jamia as well as uh, Brother uh, Ziad uh, on uh, the uh, presentations. But I just want to touch up on uh, uh, what uh, uh, Comrade uh, Ziad was speaking on uh, now. Uh, and I think uh, such a bill uh, needs to be brought uh, within uh, the political formations uh, that uh, constitute uh, parliament. Uh, we need to approach uh, all the political parties in parliament. And I do believe that we will uh, enjoy uh, uh, the much needed support from the uh, former uh, oppressed communities. Uh, that uh, uh, have seats in parliament. And in that regard, uh, we should uh, be able to uh, pass such a bill. But I also want us to consider uh, legislators, not only in uh, uh, the, our own space as South Africa, but in the SADC region, in the other regions of the African continent, whether it be East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, or the Maghreb region. And in so doing, we should not lose sight in looking into the Pan-African Parliament and utilize it as you have seen uh, during uh, uh, the tenure that His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa utilized his uh, position as the chair of the AU. He did uh, put uh, the Palestinian issue right on uh, uh, one of the prioritization of what we needed to focus on. And in that say, uh, we therefore need to focus on the African regions and the African continent at large. But uh, we also need to look at uh, the uh, other sectors. Uh, how do we utilize BRICS countries to further spread uh, the word? And uh, how do we uh, uh, also utilize uh, uh, our voice as South Africa and our experiences to ensure that we can mobilize uh, 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 MPs 
for Palestine initiative. And I think uh, if we can start uh, addressing a number of speakers globally to allow us to engage with members of parliament uh, broadly, we will then start uh, having a global uh, uh, imprint on uh, this bill. And I want to thank everyone who has uh, uh, truly uh, uh, given uh, their time to uh, bring this bill uh, before us so that we can have a look uh, and uh, speak about it. And I wish everyone well going forward. Thank you, Comrade Eddie, for affording us the opportunity. Thank you very much, Comrades. Thank Comrades, uh, thank you so much to all our speakers. I think it's been a very inspirational evening. Uh, we have such powerful presentations and uh, inputs, and I think it's created some kind of excitement once again amongst us. So the PAC will be communicating with comrades out there um, in terms of a program of action. So look out for your emails and, and follow our Facebook. It's always being updated um, every single day. And uh, hopefully the panelists and all of us will get together soon. Thank you so much. Have a safe weekend. Enjoy your evening with your families. And uh, yeah, see you again sometime. Amanda. Thank you. Long live the chat. Thank you. 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 Thank you.